Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first Bay Nature Talk of 2021, Chaparral Ecology and the Fire Following Plants Around Us. I'm Christina Toms with the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board and the California Native Plant Society, and I'm so grateful you could join us. This talk is part of an ongoing series led by Bay Nature Magazine with the technical support of staff from the David Brower Center in Berkeley. Today's speaker is Heath Bartosh, co-founder of Nomad Ecology and an expert in Bay Area flora, especially the plant communities of the East Bay. Heath has over 20 years of experience working in the natural resource and environmental fields, and he serves the California Native Plant Society as chair of its Rare Plant Program Committee. One of his primary research interests is the fire ecology of native chaparral communities and the rare annuals that follow fires in these ecosystems. Before we begin, a little housekeeping. If you experience technical difficulties at any point during the program, know that the webinar is being recorded and Bay Nature will send you a link to the recording once it's available. If you have any questions during Heath's talk, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them during the Q&A session after the talk. Thank you to everyone who registered and a special thank you to those who made a donation. You can learn more about Bay Nature Magazine and the California Native Plant Society at baynature.org and cnps.org respectively. And with that, Heath, please tell us about yourself and tell us more about these incredible plants. All right, thanks, Christine. I really appreciate it and appreciate being here uh, talking to uh, all the fans of Bay Nature and fire following fans. I. Uh, have to say that um, <clears throat> Bay Nature is uh, near and dear to my heart because they do like to showcase the stories of the plants that most people don't really get a chance to get down on the ground and think about or look at. So um, really appreciate the opportunity. And how about a big round of applause for Bay Nature out there? Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm a Southern California guy. Don't hold that against me. Uh, grew up in Ventura County, four generations down there. My dad was a fireman. And it's funny, you know, um, never thought about being a fireman, but somehow our career choices uh, ended up crossing paths in, in, a, in a, some kind of way. So it's, it's funny how life is. Um, but I also wanted to uh, uh, give you some themes to think about today for the, day, the day's talk, um, just while we're running through this. Um, first one is, Think about indigenous burning practices and how they may have influenced um, what we're talking about today. Um, think about your own reactions to fire. And generally, right after a, a fire, you know, people um, have this sense of dread and, and uh, you know, there can be a little, a little bit of hope out there. Um, think about plant distributions, you know, plants ranges. Think about seeds as living embryos. Um, think about fire adaptations, not the sense that plants need fire, but they are adapted to it. Uh, and then also think about climate change winners, because I know that we tend to focus on the losers when it comes to climate change, but some cases, you know, um, climate change winners are out there. So this is a good topic for it. And then throughout the talk, I'm going to be circling back, back to uh, Mount Diablo here and there, because, uh, well, it's sort of the center of at least my universe, um, and it provides some good local examples. So um, we'll be seeing Mount Diablo a few times here. So, whoa, back to 2009. This is me. Uh, this is really my first um, big experience um, looking at post-fire chaparral ecology. It was just after the, more, uh, the Basin Complex fire in Big Sur. And um, I had working, been working there before the fire and then continued to work there after the fire um, and off and on until about 2013. And uh, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Brian Peterson, actually was working down there with me in 2013. And it was about that time that the Morgan fire hit on Mount Diablo. And so Brian and I were uh, thinking of a way to um, we wanted to create a, a quick and scalable method to do some uh, chaparral uh, fire study on um, particularly annuals, uh, post-fire annuals that would be long-term and that we could document chaparral recovery throughout the north and, and central or south coast ranges of California over a long period of time. This is intended to be a long-term study here. 
And so since 2014, the first year after the Morgan fire, we've had eight separate studies, um, collected data in 147 plots, um, and got a total of 5,739 quadrats worth of data. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot to analyze there and it's still ongoing. And in fact, in 2021, we're gonna be looking at the SCU fire um, with about 30 plots and about 1,530 quadrats going. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be doing some work out there. But to date, as you can see on this map here, um, the dark red polygons are the fires that we've looked at. So the Rocky and the Jerusalem, the Tubbs and the Nuns fire, Morgan fire, there was a little fire in Walnut Creek called the Valley fire we looked at, the Tesla fire and the Basin complex. And then the pink polygon is, is the SCU fire we're gonna be focusing our efforts this year. Um, you know, folks at Bay Nature might recognize this, um, this picture, but I, I wanted to bring it back. And um, because I like it, it's a great illustration, but it's also a real, it really encapsulates what the first um, one, two, possibly three years are after a fire. And so you get, you know, obviously the burn, then some recovery with, you know, a few plants in there. And then, you know, the second and third year, the shrubs really start to take over. So this is kind of, this frames our whole discussion really today. And um, if you want to learn, see this image in action, um, it's on the Bay Nature website. You can uh, scroll around and also read some good articles on the on the Morgan fire from a few years ago. So, but this is the real life version of what you know post fire environments look like. This is Cache Creek, um, up north in Lake County. Big masses of chaparral that burn there. Some seedlings coming back in recovery. Grasslands that the thatch had been burned off, and a big show of wildflowers afterwards. Um, and then some uh, mixed gray pine and, and chemise shrublands where uh, you have some woolly sunflowers really, really just going off there. And then here at Mount Diablo, some nice poppies for you. I wish I could hear the oohs and ahs, I'm sort of missing out on that. Um, but then again, you know, circling back to uh, Mount Diablo and this image here by Stephen Joseph uh, really shows the breadth and the intensity of the fire as it burned um, on Mount Diablo in 2013. And a lot of people seem to think that Mount Diablo is a, uh, is a volcano, even though this picture sort of resembles that. It's, um, it's not true, it's totally not true. Um, but yeah, this was the start of it really. <clears throat> so looking at the, at the uh, landscape out there, the burn landscape, and trying to understand what's going on there, um, really looking at a project and uh, some studies that were driven by data gaps. So to document fire followers in the North and Central California coast ranges, really, because there's not a whole lot of information out there about them. You know, what species are fire followers? Um, how strictly fire following are there? Um, then to understand the diversity dynamics of these herbaceous species is what is driving it? Is it soil types? Is it fire severity? Is it veg types? Um, and the same thing for rare plant dynamics, as well as, you know, are weeds, uh, are, can they habitually um, get themselves established in burned areas, um, even just outside of, of things like fuel breaks and um, other fire abatement measures? Um, then one of the bigger questions that we have is really, are there regional fire uh, follower floras? So are there cohorts of fire followers that only live in certain areas and then um, not in others? You know, what are the distributions of these fire followers? Um, you know, the, as I mentioned, developing a simple effective sampling technique and then building and expanding a database to where we have scientific information on what are fire followers? Can they be recorded and documented and analyzed in a database this way to actually identify what they are and what species they are and how long that they persist in the landscape after a fire? So back to the data gap idea, this map shows um, all of the post, uh, post chaparral fire 
studies that are focused on annual herbaceous species. And there's really not that much. Um, most of it's down in Southern California, but as you come up to Central and Northern California, there's really not a whole lot of stuff going on there in terms of studies like these. And so the information is, is um, you know, really not out there. And that's a big chunk of land. So we want to figure out and find out what's going on there. But before we kind of get any further, I wanted to at least throw out some terms there for you guys um, and get comfortable with what post-fire speak is like. So fire intensity is, is really um, what represents the energy release during various phases of a fire. So it's actually what is, you know, the flame intensity, the heat intensity, those kinds of characteristics of a fire as they are happening. The fire severity, which is correlated with fire intensity is defined as the loss or decomposition of organic matter above and below ground, um, using things to measure it like soil modifications, ash characteristics, consumption of litter and duff layers, diameter of twigs on remaining branches, crown volume, scorch, et cetera. Um, and so, it, Fire severity is also kind of used synonymously with burn severity. And so uh, those two are, are interchangeable, really. Um, so the next thing is pyrophytes. And so most often, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, most often pyrophytes, uh, they're referred to as fire followers. Um, these are early successional plant species that are fire adapted to the point where fire released effects are created, are required to complete their life cycle. So we're talking about things like heat, smoke, um, ash. And in some vegetation types, fire followers are short-lived on the landscape and often include species that are considered rare or either locally rare. Uh, um, of the vegeta vegetation types in California, fire followers are most often associated with chaparral. You know, that's something that most everybody I think has an idea about, but um, we also spent some time studying this to try and make that definitive call there. And, um, you know, various uh, categories of these fire followers have, uh, or various categories have, I'm sorry, uh, fire followers have been put into various categories, um, particularly by um, John Keeley, who's one of the preeminent chaparral fire ecologists in California and the world, I would say. But, um, you know, he's created these um, categories called post-fire endemics, which are essentially like plants that only come up after fire. And then, post-fire specialists, which, you know, they, um, they can come up under after a fire, mostly come up after fire, but can also be pulled out of the ground by some other uh, disturbance events like a landslide or even a road cut. And then post-fire opportunists are more like fire followers that aren't strictly fire followers and can also be um, um, germinated with other activities or maybe just some heavy rainfall. Um, they're just making an opportunity of the habitat that's opened up to them um, during or after the fire. Um, then life history traits. So we're talking about annuals, perennials, uh, geophytes, shrubs, trees. And then within that, there are plants that are fixing atmospheric nitrogen um, that are out there. Um, and then, uh, of course, the rare plants and the weeds. Now a little bit about fire ecology, which is, uh, it's a branch of ecology that focuses on wildfire, wildfire and its relationship with the environment that surrounds it, both living and non-living. So we're talking about things like fuel structure. Is there, is it a grassland with zero ladder fuels and only herbaceous fuels? Or is it say a mixed woodland and shrubland where there's ladder fuels and a very tall trees that can burn? Um, and then fire return interval of course is, what is the period between one uh, fire event to the next is fire return interval. And severity we talked about just uh, a few moments ago um, is just a measure of how, um, what's left after the fire, you know, how hot did the fire burn and what was the result on the vegetation and the landscape. Um, and then life history and species assemblages we went over a little bit with um, uh, region, potential regional, uh, fire follower floras. So just to give you an idea, just a quick map here of, of chaparral that exists in California right now or within the last couple decades. It's a lot of habitat there for fire followers to um, occupy. 
And you can get the sense just looking at this map that, yeah, you could, you could understand why there's um, certain fire followers that pop up somewhere or in some places over others just because of the geographic isolation that some of these chaparral patches have between each other. All right, so just take a second here, look at the characteristics of this chaparral patch. This is on the north side of Mount Diablo and ask yourself a couple questions like, what is the structure like? Uh, is it welcoming? Could you walk in there with ease? Um, is it diverse as it looks right now? And what would it look like if you imagined it burning? So here's uh, some answers to some questions about fire ecology and, and frequency. This is brought to us by our friends at the uh, California Chaparral Institute. If you haven't had a chance to uh, look on their website, um, I would encourage you to because they're um, actually um, leading the charge on, on protection of chaparral statewide. But first of all, um, chaparral, the typical condition is that it, it has large low frequency fires um, and that's just the way it burns. Then the age and density of chaparral has little to do with the occurrence of such large fires. So a lot of times you'll hear people talk about, um, you know, fuel loading in, in chaparral um, or that it's old growth and is ready to burn and doesn't really have um, anything to do with that. Then the fire regime that it experiences, it's a crown fire, completely burns off everything and leaving nothing but, I like this, this, um, this term here, it's an ashen moonscape. And the natural fire return interval for chaparral is about 30 to 125 years. And so if you think of that in the context of some of these fire followers that these living embryos and these seeds will live in the seed bank for 30 to 125 years between um, fire return intervals. But on the other side of the spectrum, fires more uh, that occur more than once every 20 years can elim eliminate chaparral and convert it to non-native weed lands, which um, completely change the characteristic and the ecology and functions of the chaparral. Just to give you an idea there of the ashen moonscape, this is a before and after picture of the same location where you have um, chaparral surrounded uh, an open space with a little bit of uh, herbs and grasses. Um, and then in the bottom right, you can see there, it's just completely burned to an ashen moonscape. Crown fire conditions there removed all the biomass with just a few sticks um, remaining. So to kind of qualify that a little bit when looking at fire severity, you know, chaparral is a crown fire completely, but yet some things remain. And so you're able to measure, and what we do is we measure fire severity of chaparral really yeah, as low, medium, or high conditions. And so you can see on the left there, um, there's quite a bit of um, um, secondary and some tertiary branches left on the shrubs on the chemise. And so that would be a low, um, uh, fire severity, whereas medium fire severity, it looks like, you know, maybe half of the chemise shrub was burned off, but some sticks still remain. And then on the far right, it's just completely burned where you don't even see burls anymore. But then fire is a living um, thing with its own mind and, and driven by fuels and, and temperature and um, conditions on the ground. And so you'll even get a lot of uh, fire headed fire severity heterogeneity, um, as you can see in this picture where, um, you know, sort of center foreground, you don't have uh, hardly anything visible in terms of woody structures. Um, whereas if you look around in the back, um, you can see some, um, it was a lower intensity, uh, severity fire um, than in the foreground. All right, so then let's talk about germination triggers um, there's really three types of germination triggers um, that we talk about with uh, fire followers. And so it's smoke, you know, here's the Morgan fire. Um, while it was burning, you can see the smoke that's going to activate uh, and trigger some germination. Heat, where things are smoldering, you know, it's some coals are burning, you're going to get um, 
long, uh, a prolonged heating environment in the soil that will cause some germination. And then char ape, and char ape is, um, it's charred wood containing leachable chemicals that stimulate uh, seed germination in some plant species. So think of it as um, wood on the ground that maybe the rain comes in the, in the winter months and the rain pulls some of those leachable chemicals off the uh, charred wood and deposits it, deposits it in the soil. And that can act as a germination trigger, trigger for, the, uh, for the fire following seeds as well. All right, so moving on to life history traits. Um, I think we can all understand what these are, but just wanted to run through a few examples here. Um, you know, we're talking annuals, um, perennials, herbaceous perennials, and then geophytes are different from herbaceous perennials in that they're things that will either have a bulb, a uh, corm, or a tuber. And then shrubs, they have their different life history strategies uh, in relation to fire, and so do trees in some cases. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you know, within each of these groups, well, really the annuals um, and the perennials and some shrubs, that they are nitrogen fixers. And so um, some of the nitrogen fixers um, come out of the gene of the uh, family Rhamnaceae. So we're talking about shrubs like Ceanothus and then all of the members of Fabaceae, the legume family, are nitrogen fixers, where they're fixing atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. And um, it's interesting that there is a big flush of these things um, right after a fire, fixing nitrogen back into the soil. OK, so talking about annuals, we're talking about um, this idea of fleeting abundance here. And so it's the dynamics of plant species, primarily annuals, that are generally absent from the landscape until germination is triggered by fire effects. And these plant species have a high abundance that typically fades between a one to three year period post fire. So that's sort of that encapsulates this idea of fleeting abundance here. And in terms of annuals, um, one of the most common um, post fire um, annuals is whispering bells, and you can see it growing in in huge profusion. I think the opening slide had me a picture of me sitting there in a big field of, of, uh, of whispering bells, which a colleague of mine, it's got a peculiar odor. And I asked a colleague of mine one time what, uh, what she thought it smelled like and took her a second. And she said, you know, it smells like wet balloon. I never would have guessed, but yeah, she was right. That's what it smelled like to me. Um, then fire poppy, you know, it's one of the uh, more charismatic fire followers, if you will. Um, I think something that people can latch on to and, and um, really identify with. Um, and then there's Kellogg Snapdragon, whose seeds are about a millimeter across. And in the Morgan fire, um, that, that species hadn't been seen for 80 years. Um, and there had been two fires, in, there had been a, a fire, uh, two fires in that period. Um, but it hadn't been seen. And to live 80 years in the soil seed bank as just a, a millimeter wide living embryos is really a testament to life. Um, and then there's things like Mount Diablo Facilia, which in the baseline condition, non-fire condition, these plants are very hard to find on the mountain. And you don't realize how widespread their seed bank is until after a fire and you find them everywhere. Um, and then, you know, even a nod to some grasses, there are uh, fire following grasses like this six week fescue grass here, which is pretty cool. I mean, grasses are cool too. Um, and then, you know, I, uh, this is sort of the magic of, of, of fire followers. I told my son um, um, back in 2014 that I had seen fire poppy and told him about it and said that, um, you know, it's, it's really unusual and, and um, we should go check it out. And he said, oh, really, tell me more about it. And I said, well, you know, it, it only comes up after fire. And if there were only another fire locally for another 40 years, I might not be around to take you to see it next time. So he said, all right, let's go. So he threw on his, I told him, you know, it's pretty steep where we're going. You should probably put on your baseball cleats. 
And so he put on his baseball cleats and went out there and we went and checked it out. But really fire poppy is, is uh, probably what you wanna be looking for out there. It's an amazing, amazing poppy species. And we were collecting data down on one part of the mountain and I could hear some people hiking up above yelling down to us they could see what we were doing and say hey have you seen any fire poppies and uh we uh we yelled back that we hadn't yet but um you know even they were in the know and on the lookout so perennials um herbaceous perennials these are some of the quickest rebounders to come up too because they already are living in the ground you know hopefully for their sake they haven't um their underground parts haven't burned and um, they're ready to come back. And so golden eardrops is one of these things that um, is also a, an amazing fire follower that is really a characteristic of California fire followers, um, as well as things in the um, Calistegia family or the morning glory family, um, widespread. Um, one thing that we found at Sugarloaf there was a California helianthella that rebounded really fast. And you can see there that it was a pretty high severity burn, but those underground parts were insulated from um, the fire um, below the soil. And so they came back really readily. Um, Rock Rose is another early, early colonizer. And it's interesting that it will come back as a stump sprouter or re-sprout from uh, um, it's underground parts, but it also is a heavy, heavy seeder, um, producing tons of seed every year, just in preparation for events like this. Um, Napa Lomatium is something that, you know, is really pretty rare, but um, amazingly at Sugarloaf, it was out there in spades. Once you burn back the chaparral, it's really amazing to see what, what's living underneath there that um, in places where you couldn't even really crawl if uh, you wanted to. Um, Another, another grass, native grass, native bunch grass, foothill needle grass responds. All the needle grasses um, really respond well after fire. And you'll see fresh tufts of green leaves even um, um, before the first rains because they have stored energy there that they're ready to pump and go. And then even the ferns are um, looking pretty good after a fire because they just uncoil themselves anew. Now to the geophytes. These are the things that really come on hard uh, right after the fire. Um, similar to the grasses, native bunch grasses, things like um, Fremont star lily, you'll see emerge um, even before the winter rains. And then by the time spring comes around, there's just fields of these things. And so they um, seem to get some, uh, some cue from either the nutrients that are going into the ground from the fire, um, or the uh, more availability of light and, and rainfall that's coming directly to them um, now that they're out from under this chaparral canopy that they, they'd love it and they just come up um, like gangbusters. And the same with other bulbs like um, Diogenes lantern up in the north coast um, and then on the right soap plant as well. Um, but even things with tubers like this skull cap here um, I, you know, I don't see them as healthy and as robust as I do after a fire. And, you know, they're really attractive plants too. And after a fire, they tend to be a little bigger, um, even look a little more colorful. Now the, the shrub life histories, um, you know, you're either in this, in the shrub camp, you're either a cedar or a stump sprouter. And, um, or both, you can do a little bit of both like chemise does. Um, but in the picture in the top left, you can see those um, little green shoots coming right out of the ground. Now that's coming right out of the woody burl or the lignotuber of chemise um, because it's fire adapted. This is its evolutionary response to fire. And so it stores energy in those, in those burls for times like this when the canopy completely burns off and it's ready to um, push out some new growth from that burl. But at the same time, um, it's a profuse seeder. And so there's tons and tons and tons of seed going into the seed bank. Um, and they're ready, to, they're ready to come out of the ground. And so that top middle picture is a seedling of chemise. And uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, in some cases, it almost seems like the recruitment 
the German nation recruitment is better the second year than the first. It's almost as if it was hedging its bet um, in case that those stump sprouts didn't, didn't take. And then Ceanothus, um, as I mentioned before, uh, is a, is a uh, nitrogen fixer, but only a seeder, no stump sprouting at all. So um, there's these mechanisms that happen over time based on a disturbance event where um, for probably the first few decades after a fire, you'll have really strong showing of chemise, but as the years go on, the chemise dies out um, because germination is low if any is happening and the uh, chemise kind of crowds the ceanothus out. So it's almost as if you could maybe judge an age of a fire by looking to see how much ceanothus is, or uh, age since a fire by seeing how much ceanothus is present on the landscape or not. Then in the bottom right, you know, we've got uh, stump sprouting manzanitas. You're either a stump sprouter or a seeder there. Um, they have taken advantage of both life, his life history traits. And then um, bush mallows are seeders only. Um, and they're pretty interesting because they're short-lived shrubs. So you can almost judge age, uh, age from a fire by the age of a, or height of a bush mallow. And then things like black sage are really only cedar. So you have these two camps in, in how, they, um, how they've adapted to fire. Now, uh, my friend, Brian Peterson, he did his, uh, his graduate um, thesis on um, seed caching rodents. And this is an interesting thing to think about like survivability during a fire and the ability to reproduce afterwards. And what they found is that there's these seed caching rodents out there, at least for um, bigger things like manzanitas, where they'll take the seeds and bury them uh, and take them into their tunnels and their burrows. And they'll put them far enough below the surface, below a kill zone where the soil column gets too hot to, uh, um, which would kill any seeds or, or um, tubers or bulbs living in the ground. And so um, what his, um, his thesis work, his graduate work was result, resulted in was um, finding out that essentially, um, if you look on this graph and that sort of diagonal straight line is depth in the soil. And so if you were to go from the surface to five centimeters, you're reducing that soil heating temperature by about 600 degrees Celsius. So soil is really an insulator and these, you know, co-evolutionary tactics of um, seed caching rodents with some of these larger seeded species of shrubs and, um, and other plants um, is pretty amazing. All right, so on to trees, couple life history strategies here. We got um, cedars and stump sprouters. Again, California Bay. I don't know if you've been hiking around and looked and seen a huge bay with a huge giant burl at the base of it. And the same with a buckeye. These things are fire adapted by re-sprouting from burls and actually forming burls. Um, and I've seen some California bays that just have huge buttresses at the base of them. And it just makes me wonder how old they are and how many fires they've been through. Um, up on the north coast, you get cypress, which really their only, um, their only strategy is seeding and they pump out a ton of seed and you can even see the seed coat um, still on hanging on to some of those early, early leaves on those cypress seedlings. And then of course our, our um, magnificent coast redwood, um, a stump sprouter, but also if you look at the bottom picture on the right, it will um, sprout up on the trunk, um, epicormic sprouting. Um, which is pretty amazing too. It's, it's just, it just won't die. That's, it's a prehistoric uh, thing that's still living today because of its tenacity for life. All right, so like I said, we're gonna be circling back to Mount Diablo uh, a couple times here. So um, back to what we studied on Diablo, we sampled a bunch of different veg types, deciduous oak, live oak, two uh, types, interior and coast, chemise chaparral and grassland. And what our data really showed was that um, the species richness of fire followers was predominantly um, a force in chaparral environments, um, both serpentine chaparral and chemise chaparral, and as well as live oak, um, which is an interesting thing because that there were some places where live oak and chemise um, stands 
kind of bordered each other. And I think that there's this push and pull between um, fire events and non-fire events that um, um, act as, uh, you know, chaparral border zones where these things live, um, where these fire followers live. Um, and then you can see the relative cover of fire following species. Um, the highest cover was in serpentine chaparral and uh, chamois chaparral. And then if we're looking at these uh, species, these uh, post-fire op opportunists, these native uh, disturbance species, um, it was really equal across the board, except we found a little bit more species of species in ch uh, serpentine chaparral, but a higher cover in live oak woodland, which was uh, some interesting results. Okay, so now um, just to, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, maybe some ubiquitous fire followers and um, some uh, uh, regional fire followers. So the ubiquitous fire followers, if we think of ubiquitous in the sense of having a wide distribution from um, at least within California from the Mexican border all the way up to say about Sonoma or Lake County where these things um, are common. But in some cases, uh, some of these species actually jump over to the Sierra um, and show themselves there. So for instance, um, um, Brewer's Calendrinia, that's a pretty um, ubiquitous fire follower, but just from the Mexican border to, um, uh, to our neck of the woods. But golden eardrops and whispering bells, those things are, um, you can find also in the Sierra, lower abundance, but they're, they're still over there in serpentine or in uh, uh, chaparral communities. And then Kellogg snapdragon, fire poppy, and blue toad flax are more of the Mexico to uh, North Bay variety of uh, ubiquity. Um, then there's also this sleepy catchfly, which is um, more or less ubiquitous. It's got an interesting adaptation, though, that if you can look on the picture in the top right, it's got this red strip of it on it, and it's really sticky. And um, I think that it must be some sort of defense against um, um, insect herbivory from ants and things crawling up the stem to collect the seeds. Um, then we have a bunch of sun cups that are, uh, you know, go to any fire and you'll definitely see sun cups. Um, they're living in the seed bank there, just waiting for the next burn, um, along with this cryptantha. Now there's this um, other interesting thing, this multi-nerve catchfly. Um, let's see if you can wrap your mind around this one. It's a fire follower, but that grows in California, but is originally from Asia. So what currently the current um, literature says is that this multi-nerve catchfly somehow got to California and is now part of the fire following floras um, from Mexico to uh, the North Bay. I don't know, maybe more study needed. Um, now some regional fire followers, mainly uh, talking about like either uh, central coast or north coast, but mostly these are central coast. Um, Mount Diablo of Basilia, uh, woodland woolly threads is um, something that it's interesting though. It's got, it's got two seemingly different genotypes where in the Santa Clara Valley area, um, Santa Clara County, it will grow annually, no problem, no fire needed. But up on Mount Diablo, you won't see it unless it burns. And right now they're treated as the same species. Um, another facelia, rattans facelia, um, mostly is just a, a bundle of prickles with those tiny flowers on it, um, but still interesting. Then uh, Mount Diablo jewel flower, not strictly a fire follower, but more something that um, you know takes advantage of the opening up of all the habitat um, after a fire, and you'll see it in more widespread places than. Um, um, than usual. And then Big Pod Lupin, Mount St. Helena Morning Glory is more of a regional fire follower up in uh, the North Coast ranges. And then Perry's Mallow is more of a interior uh, South Coast range thing. But really, I mean, the message is, is this is fleeting abundance and you have about three years after any fire, really two before uh, uh, to get a chance to see these things before um, the uh, normal conditions take over. And I just show this series of pictures from the same location, more or less. Uh, year one, 
That's this is in uh, Corral Hollow in Tesla. Year two in the middle, and year three on the bottom right. And so you can see your opportunity is fleeting to see uh, see these fire followers before uh, um, normal conditions take back over. Now, you know I don't want to end it on a bummer, but there are some concerns out there, um, climate concerns, um, management concerns, and you know I said at the beginning to focus on let's think about climate change winners, and no doubt, with an increase in fire fire followers are gonna um, have a better edge on them. But there's this sweet spot between fire intervals where if it's too often, it's too much. And so this picture I think is a great example of um, three different burns. One in 1970 uh, that only burned the top left. One in 2001, which burned sort of the middle of the picture, um, again after 70. And then in the bottom right, you see three um, fires that were too close together, 2001 to 2003, that's, that's way too close. And so you can see what it looks like when you have shrubs, um, shrublands that are burned too often, um, they become weed patches um, and uh, mainly herbaceous, uh, herbaceous communities. And the other thing I wanted to leave you with is this idea that chaparral needs to be managed. And um, this was a cover of Fremonti, the CNPS, uh, California Native Plant Society um, Scientific Journal. And this um, comparison photo was put out there by the Chaparral Institute because they are one of the ones that are uh, fighting against management actions like these. And you can just kind of read the caption, but the last sentence is, is interesting, is that the mastication shown above continues around a culture pine tree plantation. The area is miles away from any community. So what are they really trying to protect there? Um, I guess the plantation, but, um, you know, masticating uh, stump sprouting shrubs is only good for a short period of time. Um, and then what are you going to do when they come back? Um, it's sort of an uh, effort in futility. So some things to think about. Um, now, uh, really, here's the punchline or uh, the valued information that I think everybody was looking for is where to go see these things. And I just wanted to plug a new CNP, uh, California Native Plant Society website and effort to um, go and document fire followers. And this is just new as of yesterday. It was um, just posted to their website and you can see the link down there. And it gives you some areas to go that are actually currently open right now. So Sugarloaf Ridge State Park, uh, Annadale State Park, Morgan Territory and Round Valley. Um, having been on the Santa Cruz coast recently, I know that um, you know, Big Basin and places on that side, I think are still closed. So um, those conditions, you know, may change and they may open the park um, soon. But uh, right now, this is the information we have for you to go out and document fire followers. There's an uh, effort that I think they've started an iNaturalist group to go out and, and help record these things. Because as I mentioned before, there's very little information about fire followers. And it's really, um, it's not something that is in the forefront of every author, you know, um, um, scientific author when they're dealing with individual plant species to note whether or not they're a fire follow follower unless it's really obvious. And I think that there's a lot more work to be done to answer these questions of what are our ubiquitous fire followers? What are our regional fire followers? Um, what's their abundance like? And um, because we've had to dig for that information or just try and come up with it on our own based on all the studies that uh, and, and quadrats worth of data that we've mined so far out there. So um, the more the merrier, it's, it's really a, a budding young um, um, field of study. And I encourage everybody to get out there and, and appreciate the burns and um, you know, enjoy the, the sights, the flowers, the smells. It's a, it's a great environment to be in. So with that, just a few acknowledgements here, um, particularly California State Parks and the Bureau of Land Management who uh, have been very supportive of our work. Um, and then all of our, our field friends out there helping us uh, 
do this work because I'll tell you what doing this work in year one and two is pretty fun but wait till year three when you're crashing through chaparral again it's not it's not the best thing to be doing but still out there doing uh doing science so uh thanks to everyone there and uh now willing to open it up to questions and and uh see who's out there i think i see some friendly faces keith that was fantastic wow what um compelling visuals just these are just some gorgeous gorgeous plants really appreciate you bringing them to life and and bringing them into our into our living rooms as as it were um we have a ton of really really great questions uh in the q a and i apologize to everyone it looks like we're not going to be able to get to to all of them but um you know we'll, we'll get to as many of them as we can um one of the first ones that popped up uh in our q a was a question about nitrogen fixers um, there was a, a question that said, why, why, uh, so the many plant species after the fire are nitrogen fixers, why do these post-fire endemics and specialists need to fix nitrogen? Does nitrogen get oxidized by the fire and leaves the soil? Um, or do the ecosystems need nitrogen fixers first as a, as a rule of thumb? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, you know, disclaimer here, really more of just a plant jockey, but, um, I can get into, uh, I can speculate on some physiology um, that I think that, yeah, that I think the soils um, do get depleted, um, at least after the first year, you know, we've got a lot of uh, bulbs doing their thing in these early annuals of first year. And a lot of times what we'll see is in the second year, you'll get these um, nitrogen fixers really making up a, a, a lot of cover um, in the burned areas, particularly um, um, some uh, annual lotus species or acmispons as now they're called. And then also California broom. You don't really see it in the first year, but the second year it really comes on um, big time. And so I think that there's, you know, this draw out of the soil and then in come the nitrogen fixers to help, um, you know, re replenish some of those nutrients. Wow, interesting, thank you. Um, we, a couple people um, asked about fire following mushrooms. So maybe this falls in the category of plant jockey, um, <laughs> not, 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 not the material for a plant jockey, but are there fire yeah. following mushrooms? Uh, you know, I haven't heard that, but there are fire following mosses and, um, oh. there was a, a fire, sorry to <laughs> totally dodge the mushroom question. <laughs> I don't know, but there are fire following mosses and, um, they were in great, uh, uh great abundance everywhere making their lime green show at, at uh, Annadale State Park after the uh, after the fire there a couple years ago. Interesting. Okay. I mountain bike in Annadale all the time. I'll have to keep my eye out for that next time. Um, another, uh, also a lot of folks are asking, you know, with climate change and, and increased fire frequency, um, two related questions. Is there a sweet spot in creating shaded fuel breaks? And is there a threshold of fire frequency after which um, these communities just just won't come back? Yeah, the, I think there is a sweet spot for um, shaded fuel breaks. You know, defensible space. It, it, it really depends where you are, right? Defensible space, shaded fuel breaks. They work, um, um, and so where you have to have it, it has to go in. You know, when you're protecting communities and things like that. Um, there's value. Um, you just hopefully are going to do it in a way where you're not fragmenting more habitat. You're, uh, you know, it's kept on the edges and the margins as much as possible. Um, what was the second part of that question? So uh, the first was fuel breaks, and then the second was um, it, it, once is there kind of a tipping point, a threshold after which um, fire occurs in these ecosystems so much that the chaparral just doesn't come back. That you actually just see a, a complete uh, shift and, and change in the vegetation community to something different. Yeah, I mean, what's, you know, what the literature says and what the studies have shown is less than 20 years is detrimental. Um, but, you know, it's interesting on the subject of climate change, you look at um, David Ackerley put the climate change model out there for vegetation communities in the Bay Area a few years ago. And um, Chamise and uh, Chaparral communities were ones that were on you know, expanding um, in those models. So um, where you may lose some, maybe you'll gain some. 
And so it sounds like perhaps, and I think you and I had spoken about this before, that some of these species, some of these fire followers might actually be quote unquote winners with climate change, that we might yeah. see see more of them more widely distributed. Possibly, or at least more abundant. Yeah. You know, they're, these things are, it's funny because the fire followers, they're really, um, they're really rare in time, not so much space because they're living in the soil seed bank in lots of different places, but what they have limited amounts of is time. And so if there are more frequent fires and they're able to, you know, germinate, flower and set seed more, that only allow, gives them the opportunity to maybe migrate more or um, fill other niches that they don't necessarily uh, fill right now. Mm -hmm. Is there kind of a maximum time period um, within which these, these seed embryos can sort of live hidden in the soil? Has there been any research on kind of the maximum, you know, like, well, maybe there was a fire follower that an endemic fire, fire follower that everyone thought was extinct and oh my gosh, now we're having all this fire and, and it's been rediscovered or has anything like that occurred? Uh, I, you know, it's so, it's really driven by a species by species um, or maybe genus by genus um, uh, abilities. But I know that from the Morgan fire on Diablo, there was a species that hadn't been seen there in 120 years. So wow. we're talking a, a member, an annual member of the sunflower family. Wow. So, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Wow. We have another question here. There's been a lot of push for more prescribed fire to manage vegetation near human communities. Can you talk about prescribed fire seasonality? Um, seems like burns in the wet soil could superheat steam and, and perhaps lower the kill zone for those seeds deeper into the soil. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that, that's possible. And also is that um, um, prescribed burns may not be allowed to get to the temperatures needed to actually germinate some of these fire followers in a good way. You know, um, that's one of the things I also thought about mentioning at the end is that, um, you know, mastication or prescribed fire may not necessarily be a good thing for fire followers because it's just not burned at the right, they're not burning in the midsummer and they're not burning at the temperatures that a, a natural fire would burn at. Um, and so, you know, given those things, I think that um, it could actually do harm uh, um, wow. more than good. Yeah. Interesting. Um, another question here, are pollinators of fire followers similar to those typically found in chaparral already, or is there a specific guild of fire following pollinators that follows these annuals from fire to fire? Hmm, that, that's an interesting question, not something I have um, thought about, but, um, you know, <laughs> Gordon, Gordon Frankie was doing studies on Diablo after the fire, um, he would be the one to ask, but I would have to say that, um, you know, looking at that image um, on the screen share, if it's still visible to people, um, that's just a calling card for all insects to come and pollinate, you know, when the hillsides are dotted with color um, and smells, I think there's probably some, uh, some draw for insects to be there just based on, uh, you know, what's happening on the landscape. Got it, got it. I mean, I will, one of the things in the um, uh, interesting things on that Laura Cunningham illustration was that there was a, I don't know if anybody's heard of the fire beetle, but um, that thing comes out of nowhere and um, actually reproduces in the smoldering embers, the smoky ash of a fire um, and then takes off, so. Wow, it's just a whole yeah. universe. Yeah, <laughs> look up, so look up uh, fire beetles and see what, see what you Wow, okay. Um, interesting question here um, from someone. They said, uh, we noticed that Streptanthus and Calicordus um, sometimes they're much larger than normal in a fire zone. We've noticed this in Lake and Solano counties. Is yeah. this due to a lack of competition or differences in soil nutrients? Are they different forms of these species? Are they fire focused subspecies or? Uh, that's what we like to call fire pump. It's when, yeah. you know, the, the nutrients in the ground just amp these things up and they're just loving it. You know, this is the time for them to produce as much seed as they can too. So they're taking advantage. And that's why I think they fall more along the lines of the opportunists is that they're eking by um, outside of these fire times. And so they're, you know, they're kind of just 
doing what they can, but when the fire comes, they get pumped up and, and then uh, really, that's when they really set their seat. Fire pump. Wow. That is, that's a new phrase for my vocabulary. Totally scientific. <laughs> Which is, yes. Here's the pump. You love. You love. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, old SNL skit, apologies to the younger folks attending here. Um, we've gotten questions from a number of folks about, um, about weeds, about um, uh, managing weeds um, through uh, mimicking fire and restoration work using herbicide sprays to manage weeds. Um, are there um, are invasive species like broom, are they helped by fire? Um, you know, what, I, I feel like I, I've seen this a lot in areas that have been hit hard by sudden oak death, that the understory, uh, you know, seems to very rapidly get dominated by, by broom. Um, does fire create conditions for, for, for species like that too? How, how do we balance kind of the managing fire for these, for these rare annuals versus dealing with these, these really problematic invasive species on the landscape? Yeah, I think, um, you know, because we really focus on chaparral um, post-fire environments and the thin soils, you know, um, really low nutrients to begin with um, soils that we don't really see the weed establishment that um, you do in other communities. Um, I think, you know, Italian thistle we've seen um, in woods as we're going by and uh, in post-fire environments gets, um, gets pretty bad. But, um, you know, I also know that, um, uh, French broom seeds are pretty resilient and can probably withstand a fire um, pretty easily. But yeah, I, you know, for other ecosystems uh, and vegetation types, I'm not really sure. But for the chaparral ecosystems, the weeds aren't really that much of a problem. That's interesting. Yeah, it sometimes feel like broom could survive a nuclear apocalypse with how. Well, because you, you know, you think, of, <laughs> you think about the recovery of a chaparral ecosystem is that, you know, a curtain opens for a short window of time and you have all this space, but then that curtain quickly closes. And so if you're a weed that's trying to make it happen in that, in that space, you know, you've only got a short period of time. And then after that, the structure is uh, of the, of the, that particular community does not really lend itself to your success. And, and he, to follow up on that, since we're talking about kind of the, the structures of, of the chaparral community, I think it might be important for some members of our audience perhaps to differentiate between inland chaparral and coastal chaparral that sure. they're, you know, could talk, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, really where the best fire followers you're going to see is when it's chemise dominated. So adenostoma fasciculatum dominated um, chaparral is, is really the interior variety of the chaparral where um, it's just almost a monoculture. Um, where you get to the coast and where you have this maritime chaparral influence, um, the fog layer allows for other species, which may more typically be understory species. Um, it allows them to kind of pers persist out in the open in these maritime chaparral environments. And the diversity tends to be uh, of different shrub species tends to be higher in coastal chaparral and the chaparral as you go further north or chaparral on a north slope. Super. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's that's important there. Um, we have to wrap up. I'm so sorry, everyone. We've gotten so many fantastic questions. Um, thank you so much for your engagement. And what we'll try to do is point you to some resources that hopefully can answer your questions. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of directors of the California Native Plant Society, so I'm contractually obligated to tell you that we have a fantastic journal, um, that we have a, a, an issue all about California fire. Uh, CNPS also has a fire recovery guide. We had some questions uh, in, in the, the chat about um, uh, you know, from homeowners about their removing uh, invasives and, and native plants that they can put in after a fire or to help minimize the risk of fire in their community. So definitely encourage you to go to cnps.org uh, to learn, learn more about that. And um, yeah, so thank you to Heath. Thank you to our, our technical team uh, making this happen. Um, and for all of you attending, again, Bay Nature is going to send out an email with a link to the recording, links to more information. And please join us uh, next week. Uh, next Thursday, March 18th, is the next Bay Nature Talk with Dr. Lizette Arellano of One Tam. She's going to be talking with, with Mary Ellen Hannibal about people, science, and nature. 
uh, at One Tam. And as a former Marin resident, I used to work with One Tam. They're fantastic. I guarantee you it's going to be a great talk. Go check it out. Thank you again. And we hope to see you next week. Cheers, everyone.